Good evening. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Welcome to the Bronx Museum. Welcome to the Bronx Museum. Let's hear it. Okay, now first I just want to say that I'm Miriam Tab. I'm the public liaison here at the Bronx Museum. Here at Bronx Stories, we do a little storytelling. We do a little singing, which will not be done by me. Uh, we do a little poetry. We do a little bit of everything here at Bronx Stories. Uh, also, I want to let you know beforehand that we're going to go down into the galleries. Uh, I want to say thank you to the Simon Boulevard Foundation for making this show happen. So let's give a round of applause to them, to our sponsors. I would like to introduce you to a very, very excellent poet and our host for tonight, Simply Rob. But it really is for me, it marks a milestone. I've been a Bronx site um, since 2001, um, originally from Long Island by way of the Lower East Side. Um, and when um, gentrification came to the Lower East Side, I didn't know where I was going to go. And I got paid off for uh, like my little $500 in the apartment that I never should have let go, right? And um, I put an ad in the paper, I answered it, an ad in the paper, and I actually ended up right down the block on 165 right down Kitty Corner in a little roommate situation with four people in a bedroom, like in, in, you know what I'm saying? And so that was back in 2001, and so for me this is really like, this really is an honor to be back on this block, on this corner, you know, um, hosting yeah. this evening, tonight. It's really, it's really cathartic. Yeah. Let me say that there will be an open mic portion of the evening, right? There are three sides to every story, my side, your side, and the truth, right? So we'll go through um, those journeys today, right? Our side, um, your side for the open micers, and then hopefully the truth will come out. It will reveal itself within those stories. So in order to become a participant on the open mic list, Go to the back right there, and they got little slips of paper that you will put your name on, and then it will go in the little basket right there, and then somebody's gonna do a little Danny White and pull the names out of the basket, and um, there are three minute intervals. And I was told that that is very strict, so whatever piece, whatever song, whatever interpretive dance, whatever your, your tap dance is gonna be, it needs to be within a three minute um, time frame, or else the music will come up and the hook will come you know, and that's it, it's a wrap. So um, the second thing is that we, one of the things that's really, I think, innovative about this evening is that not only will you have the storytellers, the features for the evening, which um, I will, I think, um, be experiencing for the first time tonight. Um, and Rachel, I'm sorry. But that. Um, <laughs> Right, so she's one of the features, and then you have Don Divino, um, aka Divine, aka Rafael, Rafael Torres Jr., right, and then we also have Frank Rodriguez. Um, so, one of the, this is sort of a touring story. So, when I tell you we're going on a journey, we really are going on a journey through the museum, starting with the back. Um, so, in order um, to start the evening, you can follow me down the ramp and down the stairs to the rear, or you can take the elevator down to the to the, um, to the ground floor and we'll head to the rear of the museum, and you'll see some seats, right? Um, please, the seat, there are limited seats down there, so let's reserve them for the people that do need to sit, right? And then we'll make our way to the front. Um, as the features continue, then the, the journey will end right back here for the open mic section. So, thank you very much. This one in particular, the curator Sergio was trying to talk to me about all the works around the room and I just kept, I was mesmerized by this and as a New Yorker I'm a people watcher, right, and I'm an observer and so this is really, this piece is entitled um, El Mundo de Afuera, The World Outside and it really, it's, it's um, footage from the outside
the first artist, um, the first artist, the first feature of the evening um, is a young buck. His name is Frank Rodriguez. Hello. Hello. Um, so yes, this is called the Rave of Man King, and you know that the artist forces you to ask yourself a question: What is that? You know, uh, I've never, I hadn't ever heard of that. So you're like, what is that? What is the rape of Nanking? Like, I've never heard, of, was I supposed to learn about that? Uh, where is Nanking? Is that a person? Nanking could be uh, a, 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 an old Jewish lady. Is that what the rape of Nanking is? And so the title draws your eye to this second panel, if you think of it like uh, in the form of a comic book that depicts the rape. And um, I don't know, it's like, a, a I guess you could say it's a ju juxtaposition. Um, he's putting the what we think of when we think of Japanese culture, the fun side, uh, represented by Pikachu, Japanimation, with the dark underbelly of Japanese society, which is uh, hentai, I think, I don't know. Um, and so this was made in 1997, and I was born in 1988, so I was nine years old when this was made, and that was the height of the Pokemon era. It's still pretty big now, but um, not as big as it was then. And one of my uh, very vivid memories from fourth grade was uh, being in the classroom and the principal coming over the loudspeaker and announcing that Pokemon cards had been banned. He said he's a Pokemon, and. Put your hands together for Don Divino. Come on, clap, 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 so he knows you really want it. When I came in, this, this piece, it moved me a lot. I was born in 1977, and a lot of these images are the images that I grew up seeing as a child. Yo represento el barrio que vive en sufrimiento. Reviento al tirano que el mi hermano dejó muerto y siento que quieren destruir el movimiento. No importa el lenguaje, tú sabes que yo te entiendo. The vines from this place where man is born dead, limbs weak, about to go extinct, where the think becomes a burden. The riot started after the burning of this black merchant for serving this black person working to get by. F life just to get high. He bought the Bronx the best die, the test drive, his death dive. This is where the mess lies. The worst thrive and the best die ran through more homes than West Side. Levato, scream no te crea que soy de gato until the spot blows. And the nine black shot goes straight through his caco. I held it down like Castro ever since they murdered my tío Tato. Tu sabes lo que yo no entiendo? La policía nunca viene a tiempo. Y siguen jodiendo y jodiendo Y siguen la gente muriendo Yo represento el barrio que vive en sufrimiento Reviento al tirano que mi hermano dejó muerto Y siento que quieren destruir el movimiento No importa el lenguaje, tú sabes que yo te entiendo I'm from a third world country, the Bronx is like Brazil The murder rate is up by the youth cause they do kill they killing cause the pain that they feel is just too real. They living for the last three days on two meals. Life is black and white, refrigerator is no frills. Things ain't looking good as life is Denzel. At the age of nine, they committing their first crimes. On the way to juvie like it ain't his first time. But I don't really care cause the youth, he ain't mine. That's how his father's acting, I'm lying, I'm still trying. Trying to reach the kids with hard beats and rhymes. Cause it's hard growing up when your school's Columbine or flooded by Sandy or Sandy Hook. You see, this picture is a page ripped out of life's book. And ever since I was young, I was taught to represent, represent the barrio that started on these steps. Yo represento el barrio que vive en sufrimiento. Reviento al tirano que el mi hermano dejó muerto. 
y siento que quieren destruir el movimiento. No importa el lenguaje, tú sabes que yo te entiendo. So that's how I felt when I seen that joint right here. This piece is deep to me. Um, when you see it, 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 when I first seen it, I just thought of like different tribes, and I just thought of a slave ship. Then, um, then Lauren was like, "This is an iron, an ironing board." <laughs> so I was like, "Wow, that's powerful." So, so this is how this one goes. I'm an African. I'm an African, and I know what's happening. Are you an African? Are you an African? Do you know what's happening? I'm an African. I'm an African. And I know what's happening. I don't want to be emperor, warrior, ruler, king. Because I am whatever my mind chooses to be. I see the world and the struggles to be free. And I bleed blood of those who came before me. Who were shackled and chained and stripped of their name and brought across waters to be sold as slaves. They work for their freedom, then work for a wage. Now their profit is made from us being encaged. And the babies we make are being aborted. Like cattle we raised, they all being slaughtered. They having a stink, we couldn't afford them. I couldn't afford to be losing my daughters, my brothers and sisters that study the time. No, we one and the same by our enemy lines. Sons bury their fathers, that's how it's designed. But fathers bury their sons in this day and time. I'm an African, I'm an African, and I know what's happening. Are you an African? Are you an African? Do you know what's happening? See, I was raised Boricua, but I know that I'm black. And somebody that knows that I'm black better than you is probably gonna try to put a bullet in the back of my head. Mm. Peace. Don Domingo, ladies and gentlemen. If you really like that, let this man know it. Right. We have the youth. We have the power in these rooms, right? You feel the power up in here? Yeah. We have some powerful storytellers up in here and some powerful artwork as our backdrops. Um, I would like to direct you now over to the final feature is in the front, the main room, so we can make our way through back to the front um, and up to, once we get through the next room, uh, to the right. And we will see our final feature, Annie Lanzalotti. Bronx. 
Bronx. Some of you moved to the Bronx because it's on the mainland America. I hear we even have some lawyers in the house who just got job jobs at the courthouse. So we need your cards. Who are the lawyers, the new lawyers in the house? Yeah! Right. These folks are for the people, not for the, no, for the persons, not for the people of the state or the city. So we, we know we're not the people, we're the persons. So get their card on the way out. So the thing about me, that nobody here knows is that I will be in the Bronx forever and ever beyond when I die. And that's because, let's look at this painting. Come on close. Come on close. Would you hold this one? Stay close to me. I chose this painting out of all Joan Semmel's work in this room. And that's because First of all, everybody, feel your good, strong arms. Let's do this. This painting is about elbow room. Now feel how hard God made elbows. Feel that. Get some elbow room around you, everybody, even the prosecutors over there. Defenders, defenders. The public defenders. Okay, so all my life I've needed elbow room. And then, now women, look at this crevice in the painting. Mm -hmm. Look at that, it's one of the darkest spots in the room is the crevices in her painting. So everybody feel your crevice. Now if we were made of ice, we'd call it a crevasse. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm calling mine a crevasse. Now, if you switch to this other arm, now you all know what this is, I don't need to educate, right? Okay. If you don't know, ask Vic, where's Vic? Where's the old Italian? You know what this is. Yeah. Spalding. Okay. Yeah. Say it again. Spalding. Okay. See? Ask Vic anything you don't know. Now. Terrific. In my left armpit, I have a tumor. Now, if you feel this, you can feel inside the armpit in the crevasse. And this thing at Sloan Kettering, they call a schwannoma. Everybody say schwannoma. Schwannoma. Raphael, schwannoma. <laughs> Here's the newest Bronx born, everybody. Give him a bow. Easy on the eardrums, though. They're, they're, you know, they're easy, easy. Yep. Um, so what happens is when I go to Sloan Kettering and they take out cancerous tissue, guess what happens to the cancerous tissue? You look like an intelligent bunch here. What do you think? Where do you think they put it? Where would they put it? What's the best borough in New York? <laughs> they have a tissue bank of frozen cancer cells in a warehouse in the Bronx where they have silos for each patient. Now, I've been a patient there since I was 18. So, my cells and everybody take this position. And she has her eyes closed. This is a, now get some elbow room. My cells will be in the Bronx forever. <laughs> Not only that, but these Bronx cells will be sold all over the world. Now, what I want to show you now is the uh, secret behind the book. So here you see a book, but how does it become a book? So if you all come closer over here, I'm going to show you how I make a book. Hold on to that. Come on over, come on. I'm going to put in my headphones, and if I don't come back in a few minutes, will you tap me? Will you please? I'm going to listen to some Shaka Khan, and I'm going to write. <laughs> now, I call this action writing. I do it with all my students. If there's any students in the room, please be a witness. Mariana, where are you? Oh, yeah, right here, right here. All right, so tell them that it's true. It's, it's true. It's, <laughs> I'm not lying. So what I'm going to do is take this long paper, put on some Shaka Khan, and you could do this at home. Tell me something good. 
<laughs> you could sing along. And I'm going to take this graphite, and I'm going to begin with that line, my cells will be in the Bronx forever. And I'll see you in a few minutes. So I just watch. buckets. I knew batteries held a secret power. 
and that this power somehow just runs out. I looked at the batteries, they were all different sizes, so I looked around for a radio or some kind of thing to get started. I walked away and he said, get back here, I told you, test them their batteries. I said, I am, I'm looking for the, what do you call it? <laughs> By the way, there's a glossary of Bronx terminology. <laughs> so you might have to look in the back, because these words aren't in a dictionary. Okay. So he said here, I'll show you. You don't need anything, you just gotta lick them. He sat me on an overturned bucket. How old are you, Imani? Okay, so I was littler than you. He sat me on a bucket and I picked up one and I licked it like an ice cream cone. Don't do this. <laughs> no, he said, you gotta focus the tip of your tongue on the cathode to taste if there's a charge in there. Anyway, I don't want to continue, but he, um, <laughs> this became like a training in uh, sexuality. I don't want to get into it. <laughs> a ball, a fly ball, in oncoming traffic. <laughs> Nick, you know how to do that? I forgot. <laughs> well, these Bronx lessons, I wish I could forget, but okay. I grew up playing in traffic, under the arcs of balls, balls hit high, till they became small and black in the sky. The ball's going back, and all the while you got your inner ear on the car at the intersection. You don't miss the ball. You don't get hit by the car. With the car coming at you, you face the open sky. <laughs> right. So don't listen to what I'm telling you, okay? <laughs> With the car coming at you, you face the open sky. You never miss a pop fly because a car is coming at you. The ball is in the air. Your feet are moving beneath you. Your ear tracks the speed the car is coming at you. Your eye, you keep on the ball. You know a car is coming without needing to look. You don't want to stop the car, just like you don't want the car to stop your play. With your throwing arm, you flag the car around you. You know which side of the street the ball is favoring in the wind. You wave the car to the other side of you. You can temporarily halt the car till the ball is square in your hands. The car inches forward till the ball is in your hands. Then the car proceeds. The car is your audience, rushing to find you. The car came all this way, down this particular street, around several corners, up Zoringa, jumped the exit ramp to back up around the corner to see you make this play. The car in the middle of the play is part of the play. It's all in the timing. I think that's my 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Thank you, and I'll be upstairs. Let's talk. I just want to say that I think as we traveled on this journey, it was really, um, it really was a journey, you know, and I think what was really beautiful about this um, selection that we just experienced is that Annie also took us into the creative process, whereas I think as artists, and I will speak for self as an artist, I like to present work that is finished and polished because it really, I can floss some muscle, but um, Annie brought us into her creative process as she laid here on the floor and just created, right? And I think that that is really a beautiful aspect of the creative process. And we can't, we can't forget about the process, right? <laughs> we can't forget about the process because it's just, I think, as important as the finished product. So um, with that, I would like to segue to the open mic section of the night. If you haven't signed up yet, when we go up the stairs, you will see to your left, as we come up the stairs, you will see a little table where you can write your name down, fold a piece of paper up, and throw it in the basket. 
Um, the sooner we get, get up there, the sooner we can start. Um, each piece, three minutes, all right? So at three minutes, the music will come on and we'll get yanked, so. <laughs> to sign up for the open mic, Miriam is walking around with the slips for you to write your name on. We will be pulling, pulling names out of, the, out of the basket. You put your name in there? So I'm not too familiar with this. Um, I, don't, I don't really do this too often. My mom does, Sandra Diaz. Some of you guys might know her. All right, well, um, it's just a short piece. It's called Runaway. This is too short. Life is a lot when trouble has overflown the melting pot. Struggle for a couple of dollars a day. Put the pennies in a jar, saving up for a dream. Because no one ever told us it would be this way. Material is anything but real. Just a ghost in the night, soothing the displaced passion we gave away. Strong beliefs treated in for, traded in for cheap wants. Forgetting character cannot be bought. Thank you. Monica S. Martinez, ladies and gentlemen. Walls built on insecurity, scarred by the daddy issue disease. He left at the age of three. He left at the age of three. Oh. So naturally, I looked for love in all the wrong places. So when evil faced my direction, my heart, my heart had no protection. I felt hard for his love, manipulated by his verbiage. He could have sold me the Brooklyn Bridge. Yes. It was that easy. I was young and naive. He mentally abused me. Couldn't see past the fact that he chose me. Could have had anyone on earth, yet he found me worthy. And just like an animal in the wild, he eyed and marked this territory. My knight in shining armor with steel of iron, stealing my heart. Before him, I lived in a dark age where you kneeled and prayed, yet it went unheard. Hands invaded places they weren't meant to touch. So when those green eyes set eyes on me, it wasn't long before all I wanted to do was listen to his love songs, strumming more insecurities into me. I was sidelined, blinded by, by his touch. But don't judge this book by its cover because I couldn't muster the strength to leave, even when he demanded the life we breeded be taken out of me. Stripped of motherhood at the age of 18, my insides left empty. Uncertainties crept upon me. The life I dreamed slowly became a nightmare. Silently I cried as I held my head up high. So when he kneeled and pleaded for me to share his life and be his wife, I gladly accepted, stricken with the belief that nothing could come between us, taught by him not to enjoy our lovemaking because sex was a chore a wife was to provide and only whores enjoy their sex lives. These were the lies he filled inside of my head and all the questions of why don't you leave and they spoke till they were blue in the face but I couldn't face my reality sorry <laughs> I couldn't face my reality tear stained face I kept out of the light I admit I lost sight until I found love in a mirror, confidence I had to acquire. But this took years to build from all the deceit he had instilled. They say one will know when enough is enough. And 12 years later, I had had enough. Monica S. Martinez, ladies and gentlemen. Addiction, and when I let go of the crystal meth, I really thought 
that without the drug, I couldn't write. And I prayed on it, and I prayed on it, and I gave it to God, and I thought, well, if that was it, then if it's between writing and getting high and being sober, or not, I'm not totally sober, but letting go of the crystal meth and not all that came with that, just give that line and stuff. Um, I thought that I had lost the guilt, and then this was the first piece that I wrote after that, and so I realized that was God's answer to my prayer. And so um, it was at a time when I was homeless on the street with nothing, trying to, um, this was in 06. And so this was when I realized that I don't need the drug and that I still have a full life ahead of me. I used to have my whole life ahead of me. And now, at best, my glasses have full but I still thirst. I thirst in the desert of what I have to show for myself, for the moisture of the purpose yet to be discovered. All I can do is spit. I spit to unchapped lips dehydrated, because for an addicted, HIV positive, homo of color in America, there are already too many reasons to feel worthless. I fall back in absorption. Judging y'all, judging me. Allowing myself to be taken to the places comparisons can lead. Depression is anger turned inward. So I write myself inside out. I write because it's easier to express than it is to hear. I spit about my pain so someone else can hold it for a while. You see, they mess with me the moment spent dwelling on my past, but I can't help it. I look back on a life full of uncertainty and low expectations. Thought out and impulsive choices. I swim in the ocean of my memories. I drown in the indigo of my pain. I am resuscitated by my refusal to die without creating a legacy to leave behind. As my virus and I walk hand in hand, toward the dawn of our sunset years together. I wring my gut out in these poems. I wear my heart on a line to be I beat back my demons trying to keep them tame because I no longer get high to escape my pain. Writing is all I have to keep me sane as the thoughts in my brain grind against each other louder than any subway train. The only way to lower the volume is by allowing them to speak through the ink. I'm not really crazy about the shit I've been writing these days. So I stack my soul with a pen. Puncture from spiritual dimensions and roll my bullet point against the surface of life's past, scratching them. I dig a little deeper in hopes that what bleeds will leave a profound sense of connection for the ones who listen or who read. More than just tales of intrigue, I drop jewels while creating my place amongst those witches, word players, and speakers of truth that have come before me, planting seeds of poetry, bearing fruits of inspiration for the ones who will succeed. My poetry is my legacy. Peace. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I hope everybody had a good time. Okay, so before you leave, which will be soon, I want everyone to go to that table and please get our cards for our next event. Thank you for coming and get home safely.